and I'm the representative of the Hellenic Foundation for Culture in the United Kingdom. On behalf of our president, Mr. Cookies, whom I wholeheartedly thank for his trust, and on behalf of the board members, and specifically Mrs. Feni Hadziathanasiadu, who honors us with her presence tonight, I, will, I welcome you to this special event that we are co-organizing with the Center for Hellenic Studies and Cora is Chair, Director, and great supporter of our foundation, Professor Gonda Van Steen. The London branch of the Hellenic Foundation for Culture, which covers the whole UK, reopened around a year ago and has always been Mr. Cookie's vision. During this year, my team and I worked really hard. We succeeded in establishing a great name for our branch. We built strong relationships with very prestigious institutions, and we keep working on these goals in London and other cities of the UK. Also, we created several events with immense impact. We have great plans for the future, and we aim to continue promoting the Greek culture throughout the, through a variety of events in London and in other cities of the United Kingdom. For, the, for this reason, we need your help and your support. We would like to invite sponsors who have love for the arts and our culture to stand by our side and help us grow even bigger. As they say, the sky is the limit. This year, we commemorate the 200th anniversary of Lord Byron's death. This is a very special occasion for me and for all people who come, from the, who come originally from the sacred town of Mesolonghi. Moreover, I'm delighted that I'm here in London two centuries later and I have the opportunity to organize an event in his memory. Therefore, I'm extremely proud about tonight's event due to the fact that we have three parts and a number, a number of honored guests who will address us. I will try to keep it short. So, without uh, further ado, I would like to open the night with the amazing song. It is, in fact, the famous poem of Lord Byron titled The Isles of Greece. It is set to music by composer Stamatis Hadjevstathiou and was sung by the renowned singer Adriana Babali in the album Hellenes Philelines, which means Greeks and Friends of Greece. I'm honored that they granted me the permission to play their song at this event.
and, uh, and now, uh, dear friends, it is uh, wonderful that we have with us tonight a descendant of Lord Byron the Sixth. I'm delighted to announce that Robin James Byron, 13th Baron Byron, has honored us with his presence. He is a nobleman, a peer, politician, and influencer barrister. Lord Byron, it is an honor to have you with us. I really appreciate your support. Sir, the floor is yours. Well, no technology involved in the few words that I will have to say. First of all, uh, my thanks, Kiraki. Uh, Thank you very much for the Hellenic uh, Foundation for Culture, for the Greek Embassy, for the King's Hellenic Center, and everybody who's put on this event and invited me to come and say a few words. But mainly, I'm here to listen and learn and uh, uh, enjoy all the other uh, performers. So I'm not going to occupy your time very much. It is, of course, a great um, honor to uh, bear the name Lord Byron. Uh, I'm afraid I must correct uh, Kyriaki. I'm not a direct descendant. You all know Lord Byron's life, I'm sure. And uh, when he died, the title went to a cousin, so I'm a collateral relation. Um, nevertheless, I do bear the responsibility for uh, the name. And I sometimes worry that people think I'm a bit of a fraud, because uh, if you're in Greece in particular, uh, the Greeks, of course, love Byron and everything about him, but there's only one Lord Byron for them, naturally. It is the Lord Byron. And if I'm introduced as, uh, as Lord Byron, they look at me thinking, what are you talking about? I mean, how, how can this possibly be the case? In fact, I, one time I was having dinner with a client um, in Athens and she arrived very late and flustered and said she was very sorry she was putting her <coughs> seven-year-old son to bed. And they had a conversation which went something like this. She said, you'll never guess who I'm having dinner with tonight. And he I said, no. And she said, Lord Byron. <laughs> and he looked very puzzled and said, oh, wouldn't he be very old by now? <laughs> And then he got even more distressed, but he said, no, no, I remember. We were told he's dead. It's impossible. So, you know, I, and I, I think that attitude is absolutely understandable. Nevertheless, um, it, it's, a, it's, it's wonderful that uh, the Greek uh, community, and, and Greece in particular, does hold the flame for uh, Byron. And sometimes, in a way, I think that um, is lost a little bit uh, in this country. Um, if you talk about Lord Byron, the poet, for many people, a vague recollection that he was one of the romantic poets, um, he had a rather adventurous sex life, um, what else is there to know, I can't remember anything else, uh, and I don't think they understand at all the incredible breadth of cultural influence that Byron had. Uh, and still has, of course, but he had it you know, right through uh, the 19th century. Think of, or some of you may remember the Turner and Byron exhibition at the Tate in the 1990s. Think of, of many um, artists uh, in the early 19th century, Delacroix, you know, uh, inspired by Byron, so many writers, something like 40 operas uh, inspired by Byron. A man of, of, of huge uh, cultural significance, way beyond um, this, the rather narrow little slot that uh, the English sometimes allow him. Um, and an example, um, the bicentenary of Byron's birth in um, 1988, I was dragged out of bed very early in the morning to lay a wreath um, in Hollis Street, which is just off Oxford Street, um, near John Lewis. And uh, I was amazed to see uh, television cameras, and I thought, um, the BBC? No, surely that's not possible. And it was actually a Russian television camera. A Russian TV crew had come all over, uh, all, all the way uh, from Moscow to uh, film this rather modest event. And they were um, quite shocked that there wasn't more being done in this country for that particular 
a bicentenary. Of course, the Russians know a lot about Byron because of Pushkin, and uh, for them, he's probably, after Shakespeare, the, the second poem poet that they really know about. So what are, we, what are we doing about Byron? Now, I want to mention one thing which we are doing and which uh, all of you could uh, help a little bit towards. Uh, it was over 50 years after Byron's death that people began to wonder why there was no national memorial to him. And a committee was formed under Benjamin Disraeli, uh, the then Prime Minister. They raised money and uh, a statue was put up in Hyde Park and the Greek government and the Greek people donated the marble for the plinth. Um, all went well for another 50 years until about 1960 when uh, the park, uh, park Lane was widened into a sort of three-lane motorway. Um, the boundary retreated and poor old Byron got left in the middle of Park Lane and an awful lot of people, many people indeed, uh, even those who are interested in Byron have no idea that the statue is even there. So we thought that the bicentenary uh, of his death this year it would be the perfect time to raise the money, not only to restore the statue, because unfortunately when it came out of the park, uh, it, fell, um, it, it fell out of any maintenance regime, and so it's not in terribly good condition, and the marble uh, needs restoration as well. Um, but we also want to move it, and we have managed to persuade um, the Royal Parks to give us a site within Hyde Park, where it was supposed to be all, always. Um, and uh, all we need to do this is to raise a, a certain amount of money, uh, inevitably. Um, quite a lot of money, about uh, over £300,000, because it's quite a difficult operation to do it. Uh, we have already raised over £100,000, and we've just recently gone live, on, in fact, on Byron's birthday, um, on uh, Monday of this week, uh, with our fundraising campaign. Uh, it's very easy to just go onto the Byron Society website, uh, Byron, thebyronsociety.com. You'll find the page devoted to the statue. You'll find a little button to click on, takes you straight to a Just Giving page, uh, you can make a contribution and you can gift aid it. And I just want to say one thing, don't think it's not worth making a small contribution because, you know, I can't afford more than 20 quid, you know. We want numbers of people as much as we want amounts of money. Of course, if you're feeling very generous and you want to give a, a generous sum, that's wonderful. But we need to persuade other institutional donors, particularly the National Lottery Fund, that there is genuine enthusiasm to do this. And I hope there is enthusiasm, and I hope everybody in this room who'd obviously come to this event would be sufficiently enthusiastic just to give a small donation, uh, if necessary, uh, because we want numbers. We want to be able to say uh, to the Lottery Fund, among other institutions, look, there is support for this project uh, all around the world. People are giving small amounts of money, um, but it's important that you know, we get some help. So I hope, um, I hope all of you will feel able to do that in the next uh, week or so. Um, other than that, I'm going to get out of your hair and say uh, again to the uh, organisers, thank you very much for inviting me to say a few words, but I'm really here to listen and learn from others. Thank you very much. Thank you, my lord. And now we are uh, going to uh, our next um, slide, and it is with great with great joy that we will present to you the next video, which is the greetings from the new mayor of Mesolonghi, Mr. Spiros Diamandopoulos. It shows the unbreakable bond between London and Mesolonghi. <laughs> Αξιότιμη κυρίε και κύριοι, συμπληρώνονται 200 χρόνια από το θάνατο του Ρόδου Βίλου, ενό προσώπου που σημάδευσε όχι μόνο την λογοτεχνία αλλά και την ιστορία τη Ελλάδα. Ήταν εδώ, στο Μεσολόγιο, όπου ο Βίλνα βρήκε τον τελευταίο του προορισμό, 
αφού ενωμένο με του Έλληνε αγωνιστέ, αγωνίστηκε για την ελληνική ανεξαρτησία. Η πόλη μα, το Μουσολόγγι, έγινε σημείο αναφορά του Ευαστατικού Αγώνα. Εδώ, στο Μουσολόγγι, ο Λόγο Βίωνα βρήκε έμπνευση για τα βήματά του και εδώ αφιέρωσε την τελευταία του πνοή και κατασκευασμό του στην ελευθερία. Ήταν ένα φιλελεύθερο ποιητή που αφιέρωσε τη ζωή του στην υπεράσπιση τη ελευθερία. Σήμερα επιστρέφουμε στο παρελθόν για να τιμήσουμε τον Λόγο Βίωνα. Η προσφορά του στον ελληνικό αγώνα για την ελευθερία μα υπενθυμίζει τη δύναμη τη ανθρώπινη θέληση και τη αλληλεγγύη. Mm. Σήμερα, με σεβασμό από τον Λόγο Βίωνα και την αφοσίωσή του στι αξίε τη τιμούμε το παρελθόν μα και εμπνέουμε το μέλλον μα. Ευχαριστούμε για την πρόσκληση να συμμετέχουμε, έστω και από απόσταση, στην εκδήλωση που είναι αφιερωμένη στο Λόγο Βίωνα. And it is with great joy and pride that I present to you my dearest friend and mentor, Professor Gonda Van Steen, Co-Rice Chair and Director here at the Center of he for Hellenic Studies of this prestigious educational institution, King's College London. I'm grateful for her invaluable support. Thank you, Gonda. The floor is yours. A uh, warm welcome from me, Kyrgios Kekiri, and, and of course Lord Byron, Your Excellencies, a very warm welcome. My name is Gonda van Steen and it's always a pleasure to welcome you to our events. And of course it's always my opportunity to show you the Center for Hellenic Studies newsletter in which you can read about our past events and more events to come. We have a rather full program for the spring and an even fuller one for the fall. If you find yourself in Greece, in Athens, in the week of May 27, 28th, 30th of May, please be in touch because we have some activities there for our alumni as well. But I'm especially pleased that with the hard work of Kiryaki Mitsu, representative of the Hellenic Foundation for Culture, and her supportive team who's been putting out uh, chairs until the last minute, and so many other contributors, we can bring you this evening, which is the kickoff event in any Byron-related events, as far as I know. And it happens not only to be the bicentenary of Lord Byron's death, but also an event that we could plan in the week of Byron's birthday. But there's also a practical reason for that. We knew that after this month and com coming up on April and May, it would be impossible to get our honorable um, colleague, Professor Roderick Beaton, uh, to, to find him free for an evening because he will be a very busy man in the Byron year. So I'm very pleased that he is honoring us by giving the keynote speech tonight. And we play on the topic tonight of From London to Mesolonghi and Back. His title is From London to Mesolonghi and Back in a Barrel of Rum, Byron's Life in Greece. He does not need an introduction, but I will still give a, a tiny one. He is, of course, the author of many books, books that have featured Greek literature, Greek history, Seferis, and a whole book devoted to Byron. And if you need a Byron refresher, I very much recommend his Byron's War. He has, of course, accumulated many titles and recognitions. But I want to tell you just what happened in 2023. That's just one year. He became a Greek citizen. He was given an honorary doctorate in Patras. And he became an honored member of the Eleftherius Venizelos Foundation, if I've got that right. More is to come, but especially that Greek citizenship really speaks to the imagination. There is an ongoing fight and an ongoing struggle going on for many more of the people who should have it and would have it and would like to have it. And I'm very glad you lead the way. It's wonderful to see Greek citizenship going to people as worthy as Professor Roderick Beaton. So without further ado, the floor is his. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Gonda, for those very kind words of welcome. Welcome, in my case, I have to say, welcome back to King's. It's not only a great honour to be invited to take part in this inaugural event to celebrate, uh, to commemorate 200 years since the death of uh, Lord Byron, but uh, the, the sixth one, that is. But um, it's also, of course, personally, um, 
always a great pleasure to be asked back to this institution where I have to say um, I've spent at least half my, half my life um, so thank you for inviting me back um, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to, be, to be here and uh, also it's a small world that photograph um, was taken at the Achillion Palace in Corfu, and uh, I just uh, have the, found myself with the opportunity to, to acknowledge the, the photographer, Megaclis Rogakos, who's with us this evening. So it is a small world. George Gordon Byron was born on <coughs> 22nd January 1788, in a house just off Oxford Street, as the current Lord Byron uh, told us, uh, just round the corner from uh, John Lewis today in Hollis Street. Uh, <clears throat> and he died in Missolonghi, aged just 36, 200 years ago this year, on 19th of April, 1824. In between, Byron led a restless life of travel, celebrity, scandal, he became the most influential and the most read poet of the age, not only in Britain, but as Lord Byron also stressed, and absolutely rightly, all over Europe. And near the end of his life, he gave up all, he gave up all of that to risk his life in a political cause, the cause of freedom for the people of Greece from Ottoman rule. In this brief talk, I'm going to take you through some of the highlights of Byron's extraordinary life journey that took him from London to Missolonghi and back, if not quite literally in a barrel of rum, in a manner that you'll hear. Not long after his first birthday, his mother decamped with her infant son from London. Byron's father was really disappeared from his life almost at the very beginning. From London to her native Aberdeen. And actually, by far the longest period that Byron ever lived at the same address was as a, very, as a boy from 1791 to 1798 in his mother's house in Aberdeen. And many years later he would write about that, but I am half a Scot by birth and bred a whole one. It was the unexpected death of a great uncle in 1798 when he was 10 that catapulted the boy uh, George Gordon into his new role as the sixth Baron Byron. And along with the title, Byron, in, in, Byron inherited the partly ruined former monastery in <coughs> Nottinghamshire that had been the family home of his ancestors for several centuries, Newstead Abbey. And I've put on the slide some, uh, <coughs> some lines from his later poem, Don Juan, in which he in which he poetically uh, recreates uh, the atmosphere of, uh, of that ancestral home. Today, Newstead is a place of pilgrimage for admirers of the poet from all over the world. <clears throat> but actually, he only lived there for periods of no longer than a few months at a time, um, <clears throat> over some four years. Instead, the adolescent Byron shared with his mother a series of more practical and pro one hopes more comfortable temporary homes in and around Nottinghamshire. And the longest settled period during this phase of his life, of Byron's life, was term time during his five years as a boarder at Harrow School, that was 1801 to 1805. After Harrow came Trinity College, Cambridge, he left there after just over two years without taking his degree uh, at the end of 1807. As a result of all this, Byron was just 21 years old. You might want to think of him as a kind of gap year student when he set foot in Greece for the first time. The year was 1809, the month September. He had set out with his friend from Cambridge, the f uh, future Member of Parliament, John Cam Hobhouse, on a version of what the English had, uh, in English had become known by this time as the Grand Tour. Their way took them first to Portugal, Spain, and the British naval stations of Gibraltar and Malta. Uh, <clears throat> after that, much the greater part of the trip was spent in the provinces of the Ottoman Empire that Europeans 
loosely called Greece, though at the time, of course, Greece didn't exist as a political entity on the map at all. <coughs> The dotted line on the map, this was drawn by a sailor, uh, Lord Strathcarran, uh, who re re recreated the trip uh, in his own yacht. Um, and the dotted line just shows where, he's, where he went by sea, but he, <coughs> he's, he's put the names up on the left-hand side of, the, uh, of the, the Greek mainland, which show the places that Byron actually, uh, Byron actually went to. It was the... <coughs> It was what excited Byron first was the ex was the exotic landscape of northwestern Greece and today's Albania. He wrote, "The scene was savage, but the scene was new." In the poem that he began writing on these travels, Child Harold's Pilgrimage, it was a primitive, raw newness of this world that first caught the imagination of the 21-year-old Byron. And it was in the wilds of northwest Greece and Albania that he exulted in being lost in a thunderstorm in the middle of the night in the vicinity of the monastery of Zitsa, where today the fizzy wine comes from. He was rescued from shipwreck by the famously rugged Suliots when he was cast ashore with Hophouse on their shore. And to the end of his life, Byron would retain a deep affection and gratitude to the, uh, these wild um, villagers, tribesmen of northwest Greece, the Suliotes. Uh, later on, at Tepeleni in today's Albania, <coughs> he was at once thrilled and horrified by the man he called the Muslim Buonaparte, the fearsome Ali Pasha of Ioannina. It wasn't until December, we're still in the year 1809, that Byron for the first time came face to face with ancient Greece. The travellers, Byron and Hophouse, came ashore at the tiny harbour and customs post on the site of modern and ancient Itea. From there, the ride through the forest of olive trees, <coughs> as Hophouse described it, <coughs> towards the ancient sanctuary of Delphi on the flank of Mount Parnassus, <coughs> impressed even the undoubtedly more prosaic Hophouse as, quote, very romantic. Byron went a bit, did a bit better than that. He had already begun writing Child Harold's Pilgrimage in Uandina the, night, the month before. And <clears throat> while he, he was staying there, he translated his impressions at once into verse. O thou Parnassus, whom I now survey, not in the frenzy of a dreamer's eye, not in the fabled landscape of a lay, but soaring, snow-clad through thy native sky in the wild pomp of mountain majesty. At the site of Delphi itself, there was little to be seen of the ancient ruins. At this time, they had not yet been excavated. And so it wasn't until Christmas Day, 1809, that Byron and Hobhouse reached Athens <coughs> and had their first close encounter with the physical remains of Greek antiquity. And as you can see from that slide, which dates from the period, the Acropolis of Athens has changed almost out of recognition since Byron's time. Byron's attitude to the ruins of the ancient past were ambivalent at best, but that's another story. In these lands and where the arts of civilization had once been born, <coughs> Byron met Greeks, not voices from the past, but living Greeks of his own time. And he heard from them about the hopes of a subject people for liberation from their Ottoman masters. In Athens during the autumn and winter of 1810 to 1811, Byron made a, a very serious attempt to come to grips with the political realities of the lands that he was travelling through. He was living at this time at the Capuchin Monastery that used to occupy what is now Lysikratus Square in Plaka. And you can just see the uh, Lysikratis Corrigic Monument built, built into the fabric of the religious building. While he was there, he wrote up his ideas in a series of notes that would be published with Child Harold in 1812. But his conclusion was dismissive and rather ironic in view of what happened later. He wrote, the Greeks will never be independent. They will never be sovereigns as heretofore, and God forbid they ever should. To talk, as the Greeks themselves do, of their rising again to their pristine superiority 
superiority would be ridiculous, as the rest of the world must resume its barbarism after reasserting the sovereignty of Greece. We can trust Byron, who, if nothing else, had a great sense of humour, to take an argument to its log logically absurd conclusion. At the end of those travels, in 1811, he came back to England, Byron abandoned those youthful researches without finding the answer to the questions he was asking himself. He still had a long way to travel. After that came Byron's years of fame, as they've been known ever since, in London, here. His years spent as a Regency dandy, frequenting the houses of the great and good, the years of celebrity and scandal. And it's often been said in modern studies that actually Byron was really, really the first modern celebrity, the whole, the whole sort of I, cult of celebrity, the whole idea of what we now call celebrity <coughs> really begins with Byron here in Regency London in the 1810s. After the... <coughs> disastrous <coughs> failure of his uh, marriage to Annabella, Annabella Milbank and the birth of their daughter, the future mathematician Ada Lovelace, Byron left England for the second time in April 1816. This time he travelled via Switzerland <coughs> to Italy and there he would remain for the next uh, seven years, though still constantly on the move, living first in Venice then in Ravenna, Pisa, and finally in Genoa. I've got to stop looking. Thank you. In Italy, Byron the poet found a new voice. His years in Italy saw the creation of his mock epic masterpiece, Don Juan. At the same time, Byron the man toyed with the possibility of a new vocation, political commitment to a revolutionary cause. By the spring of 1823, he was beginning to think of a new departure. More often than not, this was linked again to revolutionary politics. In letters and conversations, he threw out suggestions of possible future destinations. Spain, Greece, the United States, South America, or even Australia, it was then called Van Diemen's Land. In the event, and for reasons that were not clear to friends and, or acquaintances at the time and have puzzled biographers ever since, it was to be Greece. Revolution against the ruling Ottoman Empire had broken out in Greece, as I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with this story, in March 1821. But from then until the spring of 1823, Byron kept stum. He said very little in public about events in Greece. And so far as we can tell, he had pretty little to say in private either. And that's all the more surprising since the Greek Revolution was the talk of the whole of Europe, Greece and its people had been linked to Byron's name, again, throughout the whole of Europe, ever since the spectacular success of the first two cantos of Child Harold's Pilgrimage in 1812. Finally, in March 1823, a group of liberal-minded parliamentarians in England came together to form the London Greek Committee, this was a pressure group in support of the Greeks. And they met, actually, in a... In a they, it was called a, an inn or a, or a pub. It's a public house. Um, that's a picture of it. So it wasn't exactly an ordinary pub, but it was actually two blocks away from here, just down the Strand, um, <coughs> towards, uh, towards Fleet Street, long gone, of course, um, <coughs> swallowed up <coughs> by 1960s concrete. Um, but they met very close to this spot at the, <coughs> in March 1823. And one of the first acts of the newly created London Greek Committee was to invite Lord Byron to become a member and lend his name to the cause. Nobody expected him to do more than that. The committee's emissaries, sent to sound him out in Genoa where he was living, were completely taken by surprise when Byron immediately declared his intention of going to Greece himself and taking an active part in the struggle. 
Byron in 1823 <clears throat> was a very different man from the author of Child Harold's Pilgrimage, who had had himself painted in the local costume that he had bought in Ioannina at the age of 20, uh, 25, 22. Um, ten years, well, the painter, he was 25 when he was painted, sorry, 21 when he bought the costume. Ten years later, he presented a very different appearance. <clears throat> that uh, <clears throat> line drawing by, um, <clears throat> by Alfred Dorsey, so far as we can tell, was drawn from life in May <clears throat> 1823 in Genoa. He had aged, as you can see, but he made the decision in June 1823. He had a military uniform made and three ceremonial helmets, one for himself and two for his, two of his companions, uh, designed in what passed at the time for Homeric style. Byron sailed from the port of Genoa on a ship specially chartered for the purpose on the 16th of July, 1823. On the way, he stopped off for five months in Cephalonia, in the Ionian Islands, which at the time <coughs> were under British rule. There, Byron was close enough to the conflict in Greece, mainland Greece, to find out what was really going on, but without, for the time being, committing himself to any of the rival factions among the Greek leadership. As soon as he had acquired the knowledge that he, ne that he needed and made his decision, he took ship once more. On the 5th of January, 1824, he went ashore in Mesolonghi. <clears throat> You've already seen this image a number of times already this evening, and I'm sure it will be seen many times more in the course of the anniversary year of 2024. <clears throat> this was, at the time, it was the principal town in Western Greece. It was also the headquarters of one of the most far-sighted political leaders of, the revo of revolutionary Greece, Alexandros Mavrokordatos, the man in the, looking rather austere and out of place in a European frock coat, and if you look closely at his left hand, he's actually taken off his top hat. Byron, by this time, had developed a very modern understanding of the power of, believe it or not, economics in the affairs of nations. Tirelessly, he worked with Mavrokordatos to secure funds and to develop the rudiments of an economic policy for Greece. Diplomacy and, recogni and recognition by foreign powers would be essential too. In both these spheres, Byron's name acted as a magnet. And at the time when he died, the first instalment of a promised £800,000 sterling, equivalent to something like 36, 36 million uh, today, raised from private subscribers in London, was on its way to the Greek government. Uh, by comparison, a cheque for the Byron statue in Hyde Park will be a mere snip. <laughs> but then <clears throat> Byron died tragically, accidentally, and unheroically of fever at Missolonghi on the 19th of April, 1824. And this painting, made in 1826, shows how quickly afterwards the event had become a romantic legend. The reality, obviously, can have been nothing like this. Ever since, Byron has been remembered in Greece as a hero, and the fact that the most famous Englishman of his day died in Greece in the service of the Greek cause undoubtedly did much to influence the current of opinion in Europe in favour of Greece. But while he was alive, Byron's true contribution to the independence of Greece lay rather in helping to internationalise the Greek cause to turn the local revolution in Greece into a turning point in what the historian Mark Mazower has recently called the, make, the making of modern Europe. To conclude, Byron's body returned to England in May 1820, set out for England in May 1824. Ironically enough, on the same ship that had brought out from London the first tranche of the loan that had been raised, partly in his name, to aid the Greek provisional government. As his biographer Fiona McCarthy describes it, I quote, 
To preserve Byron's body for the voyage, holes had been bored through the layers of wood and tin, and the coffin set in a larger outer cask containing 180 gallons of spirits. Well, there, with apologies, is your barrel of rum. In this manner, George Gordon Noel Byron, as he was now known, returned to his starting point. In July, huge crowds turned out to watch his funeral procession make its way through central London. On his way to his final resting place in Hucknall Church, in his ancestral Nottinghamshire, Byron's cortege passed along Oxford Street, close to the spot where he had been born 36 and a half years before. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Beaton. I feel we go into the Byron year with all the knowledge we needed to have and all the refreshers we needed. Thank you so much. You've also done a, a great job of demystifying certain aspects about Byron. I want to make it to Mr. Longi myself. I've never been to my great shame. Also, special thanks, Ambassador Yanis Tsaoussis, for joining us. I'm, I'm very glad you could time, make time in your busy schedule to be with us. Thank you. And now we switch to the second main component of our evening, which is a documentary made by Ms. Kiryaki Mitsu. And the title is From Missolonghi to London. So we take the reverse direction, 200 years later, with a focus on diaspora professional Greeks living among us who have been inspired by Byron, but who also made a life in London. Kiryaki has done the hard work, but she extends special thanks to the participants, Thanasis Gavos, Spiros Kitsinelis, and Menelaos Danelis Vulgaris. Thank you. Οι γονεί μα, 
κάπου έξι γενιές πίσω δηλαδή, για να δοθούν εμείς να ζούμε σήμερα στη δική σου χώρα. Όμως τα το παιδί θα ήσουν όταν θα περαιδιάβαινες τούτος τους δρόμους που δύσκολα θυμίζουν τα χρόνια τα δικά σου. Όμως στο σχολείο, η Εκκλησία,
για να την κατάσταση και για τον σκοπό τον οποίο πίστεψε για την ελευθερία του Ελλήνου και ίσω και να μην είναι στην Ελλάδα. Από μικρό, τον οποίο αναγνωρίζω ω ένα μείγμα ψυχολογίδι. Έναν άνθρωπο ο οποίο μέσα στο κοινό των ηρών τον έπρεπε το πράγμα του, αλλά ο οποίο ήταν πάντα ένα κομμάτι τη ιστορική παράδοση. Όπω επίση, κάποια φορά οι παιδιά του ψυχολόγοι. Ήξερα από τον γιο τη κυρία Γεωργία και την Καρδουλέα Βίωνα και καταλάβαμε ότι εδώ είναι ένα κομμάτι τη πόλη. Είναι ένα άνθρωπο ο οποίο έχει την πολέμηση στην πόλη και μου φαίνεται πάρα πολύ φυσιολογικό. Και έτσι θα πω ότι όταν ήρθε εδώ σε μια μισή ώρα νωρί και σε κάθε συζήτηση με κάποιου πεταλού μέσω δουλειά ανέφερα από του ομολόγου.
While we fix the setup, I can introduce a third part, a third component of our evening. But first, a warm thanks to all the participants in this documentary who really feel, uh, make us feel that Byron speaks to newer and younger generations. It's quite exciting. 
Ms. Kiriakim Mitsu also treats us to a performance work in progress that she calls Manfred Echos. It is inspired by um, Byron's Manfred, of course. And the team with whom she has worked, the cast, consists of the following people. Vasilia Kenanoglu is an actress, singer, and cellist. Constantinos Delidimoudis is also an actor. And Todoris Papadimitriou is an awarded composer, conductor, cellist, and pianist. Also behind me, on a loop, you will see images. They come from a collection called Onda Kemin Mi Onda, To Be or Not To Be. And they have been produced by Andonis Kutrumbis. He's a producer, performer, and graphic artist who's given us generous permission to use the images. It'll, it will take us a few minutes to set up, so bear with us. Thank you. Slaves scoff not at my will, 
the mind, the spirit, the promethean spark, the lightning of my being is as bright, pervading, and far dashing as your own, and shall not yield to yours, nor to in play. Answer, or I will hit you where I am. No, none. It's safe. One moment that we part. I will be all your face to face. I hear your voices, sweet and melancholy sounds, as news causes, and I see the steady aspect of a clear large star, but nothing more. Approach me as you are, O oh mind, or all in your accustomed forms. I have no choice. There is no form on earth here is so beautiful to me. Let him who is most powerful yet take such aspect as not that you may seem most fitting. Come! Spirits I have raised abandon me. The spell which I have studied baffled me. The remedy I reckon of forged me, I live no more in superhuman aid. It hath no power upon the past and for the future. To the past be governed in darkness, it is not of my search. My mother earth, and thou fresh breaking day, and you the mountains, why are you so beautiful? I cannot love you, and thou the bright eye of the universe that openest over all, and so all hearts of delight, thou shinest not in my heart. And you, the crowds, upon whose extreme edge I stand, and on the torrent spring beneath, behold the tall pines dwindle that the shrubs in business of distance, when a leap, a stir, a motion, even a breath that would bring upon my breast, upon its rocky bosom's bed to rest forever. Wherefore do I pause? Yet I do not plunge. I see the peril, yet do not recede. And my brain reels, and yet my foot is firm. There is a power upon me which withholds and makes it my fatality to live. If it be life to wear within myself this fairness of spirit and to be my own soul's sepulchre, for I have ceased to justify my deeds unto myself. The last infirmity of evil. I, thou winged and cloud living minister. Nor look upon the earth with human eyes, 
the birth of their ambition was not mine, the aim of their existence was not mine. My joys, my griefs, my passions, and my powers made me a stranger, though I wore the form. I had no sympathy with greedy flesh, nor with the creatures of play that girded me. Daughter of air, I tell thee, since that hour, my words are breath. Look at me, my sleep, or watch my watchings. Come and sit by me. My solitude is solitude no more. But evil with the furies, I have gnashed my teeth in darkness the returning morn, then cursed myself till sunset. I have prayed for madness and blessings. I have affronted death, but in all that the demon held me back, backed by a single pair which would not break. In fantasy, imagination, all the affluence of my soul, which one day was a crazy creation, I plunge deep with like an empty way, and I back into the gulf of my unpleasant fold. I plunge to this one time, forgetful as I saw to know, say what is to be found, is that I have to learn. My sciences, my long pursuit of superhuman art, is more so here. I dwell in my despair and labor. with them. Do so in any shape, in any hour, with any torture, so it be the last. I will not swear. Obey. To whom? The spirits whose presence I command. In the name of those who have me. Seal on us and steal from us, yet we live, loving our life and dreading still to die. In all the days of this desert yoke, this vital weight upon this struggling heart, which sinks with sorrow or beats quick with pain or joy that ends in agony or faintness, in all the days of past and future, for in life there is no present, we can number how few. How less than you, wherein the soul forbears the path for death, and yet draws back as from a stream in winter, though the chill be but a moment. I have one resource. Still in my science I can call the dead, and ask them what it is to dread to be. The sternest answer can be but the grave, and that is nothing if they answer not. That which I love will still be beautiful, happy in giving happiness. What is she? What is she now? A sufferer for my sins? A thing I dare not think upon? Oh, nothing. Within few hours, I shall not call in vain. Yet in this hour, I dread the thing I dare. Until this hour, I never shrunk to gaze on spirit, good or evil. Now I tremble and feel a strange cold thought upon my heart. But I cannot, even what I most abhor, and champion human fears. The night. Approaches. Look on me, the great. 
pray for change me more than I am changed to me. Thou love me too much as I love thee. We were not made to torture us each other, nor it were the deadliest sin to love as we have done. Say that thou lovest me not, that I bear this much love for both, that thou wilt be the one of the blessed, and that I shall die, for it cannot have a boldly face conspired by me in existence, in a life which makes me shrink from immortality, a future like the past. I know not what to ask, nor what I see. I feel but what thou art and what I am. And I would hear yet once more before I perish the voice which was my music. Speak to me. For I have fallen beamlessly all night, sound the slumbering birds from the house horse, and walked the mountain hoofs, and made the caves acquainted with our way yet. But thou art silent, all. Yet speak to me. I have watched the stars and gaze over heaven in vain in search of thee. Speak to me. Oh, 
words not tempt me. I have not been thy Jew, nor am I thy friend, but was my own destroyer, and will be my own hereafter. Back, you buffalo fiends. Thank you so much. It has been a really pleasure working with you, all of you guys. Um, Vasilia, Thodoris, Konstantinos. I have to say that Vasilia and Thodoris are coming from Thessaloniki and Athens. We worked through uh, Zoom and then they came here to present their own performance, which is also tomorrow, uh, no, Sunday, 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 at the Union uh, Theater. Uh, and uh, at five o'clock. So if you want to see their own performance, please um, do go to their uh, show. And a special thanks to uh, Constantinos, with whom we have worked in the past as well. So thank you so much, guys, and thank you so much for that. Also, uh, thank Uh, I would like to thank uh, our embassy for uh, their support and uh, the great cooperation. Uh, we have uh, so far our ambassador in the United Kingdom, Mr. Yanis Chaoussis, and uh, Stavrila Metaxa. I would uh, like to thank um, very much <laughs> my dear friend and colleague, George Sotiropoulos. Uh, I should have gone to the thanks. This is why you're looking at me. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> not my strong point. <laughs> so I would like to thank very much my dear friend and colleague, George Sotiropoulos. Uh, George has been working uh, really hard for this event for several weeks. Uh, moreover, I would like to thank Spiros Kitsinelis. You saw him also on the video for his uh, lovely posters um, for the event. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Sofia Cristina de la Tola for the PowerPoint presentation, Michael Rapis for the text editing and content creating, Lefki Papacharelambus for uh, her special um, uh, support, uh, help and support as uh, she is our volunteer advisor, uh, and Angela Osmanay that you all met in the, at the reception desk when entering um, in the building. Uh, at this moment, I would like to say thank you to all our uh, media sponsors, Agustinos Galiasos, Greek List, LGR, Vasula Christodoulou, Hellenic Post, Ephesus Vienna, Natasa Vissarionos, Air News, Antenna, who is over here with us tonight, and Isaac Aripidis, uh, Thanos Gavos, of course, and Menelaos as well. Um, Menelaos is not the media sponsor, but uh, I just remember that it's... I haven't thanked Menelaos for the documentary, so uh, special thanks to Menelaos as well. Uh, and of course, thanks to all of you that have been here tonight, and um, uh, we really, um, uh, we really uh, honor your support. Thank you so, so much, and it's time for Krasaki, as Gonda says. <laughs> Thank you so much.